Good morning. Welcome to the Cathedral of All Souls today. Uh, we always like to acknowledge first between, before our service that we gather on the traditional land of the first people of Asheville, the Cherokee people, who are still here. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the life of the Eastern Band, our regional tribes. So, a few announcements today. This afternoon at 4 p.m., we'll have the final installment of our uh, Cathedral Arts Series offerings for Lent, and that's the Asheville Gay Men's Chorus here at 4 o'clock. It'll be wonderful. Please come, enjoy, bring your neighbors, invite your friends. Because Palm Sunday is next Sunday, um, Thursday and Friday, Kim Miller will be teaching people how to make palm crosses. So if you'd like to learn how to fold palms into the palm crosses, you can join her and the schedule is right here in your bulletin, but anybody is welcome to come and participate in that. Tuesday during Holy Week, um, I'll be leading an intergenerational sta Stations of the Cross over in the parish hall, and following that, we will have just a small soup supper. If you'd like to come, just do us a favor and jump online and register or let us know, give us a call, just so I know how much food to have on hand. But uh, we hope that you'll get to be a part of all of our offerings for um, the, the great Holy Week that's upcoming. A couple of dates to just keep on your calendar. Um, April 26th, there's going to be a, a golf tournament called the Bishop's Cup that is going to be benefiting Lake Logan. So. If you are a golfer, if you are interested, we are going to be fielding a team here from All Souls. So please do check that out on the Diocesan webpage and keep April 26, 9.30 a.m. in your calendar. One last save the date. We will be having an all-parish meeting April 28th, that Sunday, at 4 p.m. in Zabriskie Hall. This is to discuss the upcoming changes that are going to be happening here in Biltmore Village with construction coming and things of that nature. And so we just want to make sure everybody's informed and so that we can talk about uh, plans that we're making. So please do keep that date uh, uh, in your date book so that you're here uh, as we discuss. We are grateful for your presence here. Grateful to be able to share Eucharist together. That'll happen right here in the center. There'll be a station for bread and two chalices, and then there'll also be a station that uh, is specifically for intinction. And if that's the way you prefer to receive communion, you can go right to that station where the lay Eucharistic minister will dip the bread for you and hand it to you. If you'd rather not receive, Come forward anyway, cross your hands over your chest, and we'll know to give you a blessing. But just know how much of a blessing it is to be with you all here today. Welcome to the cathedral. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy and
I invite you to turn in your Book of Common Prayer to page 351, where you will find the penitential order. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in the will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and, in, and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord. I will put my new law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my, shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, 
says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he had suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Here with the Spirit is saving, saying to God's people, Thanks be to God. some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was born in Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord.
In the name of the one true and living God, amen. I want to thank Dean Sarah for inviting me to preach while Will Bryant is at Lake Logan leading the youth of our church in a retreat. I'm help, happy to help in any way that I can. Now the gospel passages assigned for last Sunday and this both speak of darkness. Last Sunday, Darkness was seen to be the place where people whose deeds were evil dwelt. As you remember, Will spoke eloquently about this darkness. This Sunday, from the same gospel, John speaks of a different kind of darkness. This time, darkness is that creative place where our life experience can be transfigured by suffering into redemption and glory. This darkness is the place into which you drop the seed, cover soil over it, and wait for it to grow and bear much fruit. What the seed is and what the fruit, fruit is that will emerge, our gospel passage explains. But in fact, all the readings this Sunday play their part, like an overture for an opera in preparing you for the proclamation of the gospel. The collect starts it off. We pray to desire what God promises and to fix our hearts there where true joys are to be found. The readings to follow will give flesh to our prayer. The psalm, one we will pray much during Holy Week, tells us that what we are seeking is to be found deep within us. Jeremiah, in another famous passage, reveals that when God gives the teaching, the Torah, the law, if you will, for the second and decisive time, it will not be proclaimed out in the open on tablets of stone for all to see, but within us, written in our hearts. You'll have noticed that I've been referring to this wonderful thing growing deep in our soul's ground by it. The passage assigned for the epistle from the letter to Hebrews gives a clue as to what the it is. The author says that Christ learned obedience through his sufferings, and once perfected through suffering, became the source of eternal salvation. So the learning, the it, of which the other readings have spoken obliquely, is that truth which grows deep down in the soil of our self, this rich, dark, creative world of meaning, and that truth is the redeeming power of suffering. Then finally, the passage from John's Gospel, which everything we've heard before it has been leading up to. The overture reaches its great big D major climax. And as you'll see, it becomes the overture for all that Holy Week and Easter have in store for us. But I'll leave that for other sermons later on to say how today's gospel speaks in so many ways about the themes of these next holy days. So from this gospel then, so suggestive and so deeply true, I'll take a verse to be the anchor for my thoughts this morning. Unless a grain falls into the ground and dies, it remains a seed and nothing more. But if it dies, it bears a rich harvest. This is an image anyone who's ever committed a seed to the soil, pressed it down, and waited for a week 
and wobbly green stem to emerge after a while from deep, deep in the earth, we'll understand. But I hardly need to tell you that John's theme isn't gardening. For him, the darkness of the soil is where the seed will die. And the seed is Jesus, who is shortly to die. Now, for us, with hymns and Lenten hymns especially, singing so potently about the power of demonic darkness that surrounded Jesus during his last days, the anguish in the garden, the loneliness of a slow death on a cross, it's hard to grasp that the darkness John is talking about is it just the darkness of desolation and Jesus' abandonment on the cross? Instead, the soil and death John speaks of is the harbinger of a rich harvest, something very different from death. No, the harvest spoken of here is the glory of God and the glory that God will bestow on Jesus. As Jesus put it, it is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. His death, far from causing only terrible suffering, is the way Christ's glory gets broken open for the world. And for John, not only for this glory to be revealed, it's done through suffering. For us, the deepest truths, the highest wisdom, come to us through suffering. Those who've lived most deeply know this. They take their suffering, embrace it, and learn from it, then come to feel the glory in their hearts. It's an old truth. Read the Greek playwrights and learn the same thing. The gods seated on their sacred thrones teach us, through suffering, the hard grace, sang the chorus in Aeschylus' play, Agamemnon. Now perhaps it seems hard to take these elevated thoughts for our own and to feel that they could be something we experience. So maybe this example from the very beginning of my years as a priest will help. I was then a curate, and the church where I served was in northern New Jersey. In those days in northern New Jersey, mothers stayed at home, kids did drugs, and the men worked in the city mostly in advertising. <laughs> Mad men days the late 60s. These men were a swaggering, coarse lot. Their chief sport was to see how many martinis they could down between Penn Station and when they got off the train at Summit. One day, at a youth group meeting, a kid asked to speak with me privately. His father, he said, was in deep trouble. What sort? I asked. He's ruined, the boy said in tears. He's going bankrupt. Now in that world of male braggadocio, where becoming richer was the only way to go, bankruptcy was the worst catastrophe. Failure was written across your forehead. It rendered you impotent to the world you were no longer invited to swig down those martinis. And the boy? Well, he'd be scorned and perhaps bullied. Now, the boy's father was hardly a man of insight. He was a high goodbye kind of fellow. You never knew him. You wondered if he knew himself. My first reaction was that he was going to make a terrible mess of it all. A few days later, his, the man's wife called me and, I can talk to you, she said, which meant, really, that she was ashamed to talk to the rector. 
a man who could hold his own in any martini drinking contest. <laughs> Would I come over to the house? I did, and in the course of a tearful and accusatory evening, I learned that he was well and truly ruined. He said he felt like he'd fallen through the house down into the sewage below the basement. They kept up appearances for a while in the face of expressions of fake sympathy and crocodile tears from their old neighbors. I figured they'd move away, but they didn't. The boy's father started talking to me about how misguided his life had been how he'd founded his sense of meaning on all the wrong things. He was going to have to turn his life around, find the right things. He told me the thing he'd forgotten about in his life as a madman was love. He'd come to think of his wife as a prop for his journey up the success ladder. And his boy, well, he had to admit he felt he was pretty much a disappointment. The man was going to have to build a new life, and he'd have to rely on them. They were going to have to become the best and most cherished part of his life going forward. They moved to a part of town where they could afford to live. They came to know how nourishing pork and beans was. It was a lean time, but as the father said to me, at least they had each other. And his old buddies, why they reached out to him. They'd invite him to breakfast before they set off for the city, give him advice. And in their clumsy way, they loved him. The son who worried his father would take out his frustration on him told me he was coming to know his father as he'd never experienced him before. The father opened up to his son, and the son was over the moon with joy. The family came back to church after a while and were received as if nothing had happened. The father told me he'd like to do the training to become a lector. You'll be good at that, I said. It was to be a slog for that family, and I'd moved on to my first parish before I saw the story end. But I heard from others who kept in touch with me that the family was, as they saw it, coming alive. The father wasn't the empty, vaguely friendly man he'd been. Now he seemed to be full of thoughts and feelings and was eager to express them. And that love which had eluded him so far in his life, he was experiencing that, thanks to his family and his business buddies, who continued to rally round him, so I heard. This man, this whole family, had experienced this Sunday's gospel in its deepest meaning. To become themselves, each one of them separately, and together, had to go down deep into the soil of rebirth and regeneration, to dwell there in that fertile darkness, to come alive again, and thanks to the suffering they endured. And thanks to that suffering, to learn wisdom and love, and to catch glimpses of the glory. At Christmas that year, I received a card from the family, and each person wrote a note, all very happy and upbeat. And the son said, You wouldn't guess what my father's favorite song is now. All you need is love. But I didn't realize he couldn't hold a tune. Now, in case you think a story from a John Cheever or a John Updike world isn't solemn enough for this season, let me first remind you of comparable stories from Scripture. There's Job, who only learned what it was like to be a man before God 
when he sat in the sand scraping his sores with a potsherd. There's Jonah, who had to take a vacation in the belly of a whale to learn compassion. And before either of them, Joseph, who sported the coat of many colors and was the apple of his father's eye, he had to languish in a well before he came to his glory in Egypt. And there's St. Patrick, too. He was born in England, much to the disappointment and embarrassment of all true Irish people. But when he was a young man, a teenager, he was captured by Irish pirates and taken as a slave to a western part of Ireland, where he was put to tending sheep and managing the huge, unruly Irish hounds. He said it felt like he was a stone lying in the deep mire. Patrick prayed every day all the time he was tending sheep. And as he expressed it, the one that is mighty came and lifted me up and raised me aloft. This was Patrick's time being taught in the school of suffering. Patrick's family and clan eventually paid for him to be freed, and he returned home to England. By that time, he became become inwardly converted to Christianity and was determined to give his life to the service of God. And after a while, Patrick shocked his family, informing them what he felt called to do, and that was to return to Ireland to convert the people there, the people who'd enslaved him. And as everyone knows, that's exactly what he did. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose wisdom and love is found where we least expect it, help us to reach deep into the darkness of our distress, to find in your school of suffering a deeper experience of your love, and to discover that whatever may befall us, we will always be embraced by your glory and sanctified through our suffering to bear a rich harvest. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, and turning to page 358 of your Book of Common Prayer, let us read together the Nicene Creed, the great statement of our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
Here in the wilderness, we pray to you, O God, that in our cares and concerns for the whole human family, the truth of your word may shine forth in our lives. We pray this day for your church, that she may drink from living springs and traverse the desert in trust and hope. Pray for the church. We pray this day for the world, especially the people of Ukraine and the Middle East, that we may come to live as one family in peace and freedom, that we may grow beyond aggression, violence, and fear. Pray for the world. We pray this day for our nation, that we may be reconciled and healed, that our leaders be wise, that our children be nurtured, and our lives peaceful and just. Pray for our country. We pray this day for those who suffer, Pray for those in any need or trouble. We pray this day for the departed, those we name now, either silently or aloud. Pray for those who have died, especially Bob Perry and Nathan Hubbard. God of mercy, in this season of Lent, we pray you change our hearts, mend our lives, and lead us to places of healing and wholeness. We ask this in the name of the one who came that we might have life and have it abundantly, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let us greet one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Make good your vows to the Most High.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
stand as you are able for the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.